Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of truth, the words of eternal life. Amen. There are moments when everything changes. Moments like that in your personal life. Moments which divide time into a before and an after. If you're married, you're married in a moment like that. So is the birth of a child, especially the first child that changes everything. The death of a loved one. That divides time into a before when they were still with you and an after when they were gone. There are moments like that in history, too. July 4th, 1776, the birth of our nation. Or December 7th, 1941, a day which President Roosevelt said at the time would live in infamy, and so it has. September 11th, 2001. But there is one event which towers above all the others, one which far more than anything else changes everything, divides time to before and then after one, which changes everything both historically and also personally for you, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. In our text, the night before he died, Jesus is speaking to his disciples about his resurrection and teaching them and us that it does indeed change everything. Because it turns confusion into all truth, and because it changes sorrow into eternal joy. As Jesus spoke to his disciples that night, I suspect that there were quite a few confused looks, maybe some raised eyebrows, and perhaps a few over our heads. And it was over their heads. The disciples simply could not understand what Jesus was talking about when he told them, a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, you will see me. It's not so hard for us, though, is it? As we look back, it's pretty obvious what Jesus is talking about. A little while, you will not see me because he's going to die. And again, a little while, it's a short time. And you will see me because he's going to rise. And after the disciples ask him, he explains it even more specifically. He says, you will weep and lament. The word lament there literally means like a funeral dirge. You're going to sing. You're not sing. You're going you're gonna to grieve over my dead body. And, and I'll see you again in your hearts will rejoice. So why is it that we can so easily understand what the disciples could not? Well, partially it's just hindsight, right? Hindsight is 2020. But there's something else going on here as well. It serves as an illustration of this important truth. The resurrection of Jesus is what changes confusion into all truth. And that's true in two ways. First, because it is the key which unlocks the scriptures. Have you ever seen one of those movies or TV show or read a book where you've got two spies and they're trying to communicate with each other and they're using a book code? You know what a book code is? So one sends the other one a list of numbers, like 153, 4, 192, 18. And if anybody else intercepted that list, they'd have no idea how to crack the code. Because both spies know a certain book. They each have a certain book. And they have the same edition of that book with the same number of pages and the same words on each page. And when they get a list of numbers, say, what's page 193 and number 12? And they look up number 12, word number 12 on that page, and they write that word down. And then they go to the next number and again and again and again until they get the message. So unless you have that book, there's no way that you're going to figure out the coded message. And the resurrection of Christ is like that. The reason the disciples do not understand what Jesus is talking about, even though it's rather obvious, is because... They do not yet understand that he is going to rise from the dead. And without that, Jesus' words remain very confusing to them. That's why Jesus says, I have many things yet to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When you were little, maybe you heard grown-ups talking about something you didn't understand. You asked, Mom, uh, what's geometry? Or uh, what's capitalism? Or, you know, something else. And your parents said, you're not old enough. Wait, wait until you're older. It's too hard to explain some things to kids when they're little because they need to understand other things first. They need to experience other things first. So it was with the disciples. Until they experienced the sorrow of seeing Jesus die and then saw the joy of his resurrection, they wouldn't get all the things that Jesus was trying to say to them because it is the death and resurrection of Jesus which unlocks the meaning of the scriptures. What did he do with the Emmaus disciples on Easter Sunday? He walked with them, and it says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. How? By teaching them from all the Old Testament scriptures that the Christ had to suffer and die and rise on the third day. And what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? This is of first importance, 
Namely, that Christ died for our sins, and that he was raised on the third day. And a few weeks ago, in our reading from Revelation, you remember the, the scene in heaven? And there was a scroll with seven seals on it, and everybody was freaking out, and everybody was sad because nobody could open this scroll. And then they rejoiced. Because the Lamb, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb who had been slain but now is alive, Jesus, the Lamb of God, he was worthy to open the scroll because Jesus, through his redeeming work, is the one who unlocks the meaning of the scriptures. That's what they're all about. The Old Testament points forward to him, the New Testament points back to him, and both of them proclaim the forgiveness of sins for Jesus Christ. That's why we can look back on Jesus' words here a little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me. Your hearts will weep, and the world will rejoice, but then you will see me, and your hearts will rejoice. We can look back on that and know exactly what he's talking about. Because we look back through the lens of his bloody cross and his empty tomb, we look back and know that our sins have been forgiven, that eternal life is ours. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It changes confusion into all truth. It does that in a second way as well. Uh, Jesus said in, in the first verse of our text from John, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. <laughs> now Jesus explains part of what he means in the following verses. He says, the spirit's not going to speak on his own authority, but he's going to tell you what he hears from me. Jesus is referring to his ascension, first of all. So notice he says, all the Father has is mine. That's why I told you that the Spirit will hear what I say and then he'll speak it to you. Jesus, in his ascension, is going to inherit all authority and power in heaven and on earth, which he always had, but he was going to begin the full and continuous use of that power and authority for the good of his church. And in his ascension, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to do what? The Holy Spirit of truth who will lead you into all truth. This is a wonderfully comforting promise, and yet it has been ridiculously mangled by many, perhaps the majority of Christians over the years. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean. I was talking to one a Pentecostal, a Pentecostal charismatic, different words for, for a certain branch of Christianity, and he was saying that this passage means that the Holy Spirit speaks to him. And sometimes when people say that, I want to ask, what does he sound like? Is his voice high or low? But other times people don't mean that he literally speaks with words, but that he gives them certain feelings. And so they think, well, if I want to know what I should do and what, how I should make this one decision or what God wants me to do with this, I should, just, I should just pray, and then the Holy Spirit will make me feel a certain way, and then I'll know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. It's not what the passage is talking about. I heard another a pastor, this was a Lutheran pastor, Lutheran, he was the LCA pastor, and he was somehow ridiculously trying to use this passage to support homosexual marriage. And if you're scratching your heads and thinking, this is going over my head, uh, like the disciples that night, it's not because you don't understand, it's because he's way off in left field and doesn't know what he's talking about. What he said was this, well, I'm a Christian, and I prayed, for, and I prayed about this and thought about this for two years, and then I felt like it was right. Therefore, the Holy Spirit was telling me that it was right. He was leading me into all truth. Of course, with a method like that, you could say that the Holy Spirit's saying anything. Right? I mean, truth becomes nothing. It becomes individual. It's really important that we understand exactly what Jesus means. Because it's not at all what those other people are saying. And one of the first questions we have to ask is, who is Jesus speaking to? The Bible is filled with commands and promises. Some of them apply directly to you. Some of them absolutely do not. God told Noah to build an ark. Not at all meaning that you need to go and build an ark. And if you don't, then you'll be drowned in a cataclysmic flood. It was a, it was a command specific to Noah. And so here in the text, who's there in the upper room? Well, it's only the apostles. That's it. And Jesus is only speaking to them. And this promise is only meant directly for them. In a special way, though, which also applies indirectly to you. See, what Jesus is talking about is the inspiration of the scriptures. Earlier in this same sermon, in this same section, in John 14, Jesus said, The Spirit of truth, whom the Father will send you in my name, he will lead you into all truth, and he will bring to your remembrance the things which I said to you. So notice right there, Jesus has defined what the truth is that he's talking about. It's the things that he told them. 
So that when the gospel writers sat down to write the word, they didn't have to sit there, well, what did Jesus say that one day? Hey, Peter, can you remember what he was talking about? They were inspired. The very words and thoughts were breathed into them by the Holy Spirit. Peter says this in his epistle. He says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And Paul says in 1 Timothy that all scripture is breathed out by God. Jesus is talking about the inspiration of the scriptures. And that's why in the next chapter, in John 17, he says to the Father, he's praying to the Father, and he says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So when he says, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth, it is not some blank check for all Christians to take and say, Hey, whatever I feel like is true, that must be the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Or, hey, we need some new revelation from God. We need to send some new prophet to us so we know what he wants us to do. Or, hey, i got this decision in my life, and I better pray about it and then wait to see how I feel. And that will be God speaking to me. God doesn't speak to you like that. He doesn't speak to you directly. Not in your feelings and not in words in your brain, but in his word. And in that word, this promise does apply to you because it was inspired and written down for you. It's a word which is focused on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to give you forgiveness and eternal life. It is a word meant to expose your sins, a word to give you the law to show you how you should live your life according to the Ten Commandments, and a word to come to you with the sure knowledge of eternal life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ which stands at the center. This is why Paul said in Ephesians 2 that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Apostles, prophets, New Testament, Old Testament, the inspired word of God with Christ in the center because it's all about him. And so if you're ever confused like the disciples were, not sure what some section of scripture means, not sure whether some pastor is teaching the truth or not. Uh, you don't have to search your feelings like a Jedi, and you don't have to have some kind of checklist. Well, is this pastor really exuberant? Is he uh, good looking? Is he doing signs and miracles or any kind of ridiculous things like that? You, you only have to ask one question. Is this what he was taught in the Word of God? And is it focused on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? I guess that's two questions, but, but they're connected. Because anything that is truly scriptural is going to be centered on Christ. Law and gospel to save sinners. So yes, Jesus' resurrection changes everything. It changes confusion into all truth. And this is then a call for us to pull away our pride. Because it is pride which gets in the way of this. It is pride when we think that what we feel is right must be right. And try to find a way to bend the scriptures to fit what we feel. And it's pride if we listen to the world, even though we know that it's the opposite of what God says. It is pride, and also lazy and indifferent, if we confront with some doctrine of Scripture which we do not immediately understand. We just throw our hands up in the air and say, who can know anyway? Let's just agree to disagree, and use that as an excuse to have fellowship with those who teach differently than the all-truth which God has given. Notice how he emphasizes that this is all-truth. It doesn't mean all-truth are all things. It doesn't mean this is the weight of the planet Jupiter. He means all religious truth. Everything that God wants us to know about himself. Everything that we need to know about how we are saved. Because the resurrection of Christ changes everything. It changes confusion. It clarity changes confusion into all truth. And it does more, too. It changes sorrow into eternal joy because of that truth which it presents to us. Uh, when I ran cross-country, there was a certain motto that I thought of quite often, and I would tell my runners later when I coached it, but it was especially important when I was running. When I was right in the middle of that race, and I was in pain, and I was in agony, and I, and I just did not want to keep running anymore, I wanted to just give in and slow down a little bit, well, it doesn't matter anyway, just slow down a little bit. But my coach was telling me, no, you've got to catch five more guys, and I would tell myself, no, I want to beat my best time. I would say to myself, no pain, no gain. You've heard that expression, right? No pain, no gain. Because I would remember other times when I had given in. When I had said, what's the point? I, I, I'll, I'll take it down a notch. Get, get rid of this pain. And when I had finished, I was so disappointed. And it stuck with me for days. I was angry at myself. But the times when I had pushed through that pain, that pain had turned into joy. A lot of runners might know exactly what I'm talking about. The, the exuberance that you feel when you finish a race and you ran it really hard and you pushed all the way through that pain is... Unlike most things in, the, in, the, in this life. 
And notice that Jesus in our text says to the disciples, your sorrow will turn into joy. He doesn't say your sorrow will be replaced by joy, but literally, your sorrow will become joy. The very thing which was pain to you will be a joy which no one can take away. And Jesus uses an even better illustration for this than cross country, and you moms will especially understand what he's talking about. Because of the corruption in this world due to sin, God placed a curse on creation. And part of that curse was in pain, he will bring forth children. And still today, it's one of the most painful things. Even with, even with all the drugs and all the things they can do, it's still one of the most painful things that many people experience. Yet, how quickly do you forget when that child is born? And the same thing which was causing you pain is now your great joy. A little bundle of joy that you take home with you and, and uh, remains with you and grows and laughs and loves and the joy of little hands flung around your neck, hugging you. This is a perfect illustration of what Jesus wants to teach, that sorrow becomes joy, both for the disciples and for him and for you. See, the disciples were sorrowful that night. They were confused and sad and tired, and they didn't know what to think. While they do not understand that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, his words about his death have begun to sink into their ears, and it is really troubling for them. But it's about to get worse, because they are going to see him arrested, and they won't be able to do anything about it. And they're going to see him convicted, and they won't be able to do anything about it. And then they're going to see him pounded to a cross, and they won't be able to do anything about that. And they're going to watch his life eke away, and they're going to see him die. And they'll think it's over. Because they don't realize that he's going to rise. Put yourself there. These men really believed that he was God. That he was the Savior of the world. That he was the Messiah. But they didn't understand that he was going to rise. The Church of Christ felt like Christ had abandoned her for good. And they had no one to protect them, no one to forgive them, no one to save them, no one to give them salvation. But that very sorrow, the sorrow of Jesus' death, that very pain became their greatest joy when he rose. And the same is true for Jesus. Jesus, in that illustration, he said, the woman has sorrow for her hour has come. And he's using that phrase to signal that he's not only talking about his disciples' sorrow, but his own. It's a phrase he often uses about himself. Earlier, a couple chapters before this, he said, Now has my hour come. And what shall I say? Father, who will from this hour? No. But Father, glorify your name. Jesus would glorify his Father's name through his crucifixion, through his suffering and his death. Jesus said later that night, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, even though he knew he would rise. He sweat great drops of blood and pain and anxiety. And the next day when he was on the cross, suffering what must have been by far the worst pain that anyone has ever experienced physically, only a tiny sliver of the agony of his soul. When all of the great weight of the sins of the world of your sins and mine were placed upon him and crushed his holy human soul. He does. How did Jesus stick it out on the cross? How did he push through the pain? He could have come down at any moment. He didn't have to do that for you and me. We didn't deserve it. Why did he keep going? Well, I suppose he said to himself something sort of like, no pain, no gain. But not only for himself, for you. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus endured the cross, <coughs> despising its shame, for the joy that was set before him. That was the joy of bringing you forgiveness, resurrection, and eternal life. I wonder if he was on the knees on the cross and looked around at the people there, at the thief next to him, to whom he had said, today will be with me in paradise because of what he was doing. If he looked at his mother and his disciples, who were so confused and sorrowful now, but soon they rejoiced so greatly because of what he was doing. If he thought forward and saw you, and rejoiced in the midst of his suffering because of the joy that would bring to you. Yes, sorrow turned into joy for Jesus and the disciples. The very body which was crucified with such pain rose in glory. And he could show those marks of the nails, not, not as some remembrance of his trauma, but as proof of his victory. The greatest of joys. And it's the same for us. 
By that I do not mean that every sorrow you experience in life is going to go away in this life. Nor do I mean that every sorrow you experience is going to lead to some greater earthly joy. It's just not going to be the case. Nor do I mean that you have to persevere through the pain and then that pain will turn into joy. I mean that Christ's suffering and Christ's resurrection are the sorrow which turns into joy for you every day of your life. A joy which Jesus said to the disciples, and he means this for you too, a joy which no one will take away from you. Sorrow is in this world because of sin. Sorrow of sin in general. But the curse that God has placed on creation so that when there's pain and giving birth to a child, it's because we're all sinners. And when someone gets cancer, it's because we are all sinners. And when someone dies, it's because we are all sinners. And then there's the sorrow of the sins that other people commit against us. When someone that you love says something unkind to you, it hurts. Or does something, or fails to do something, is inconsiderate, and it hurts. Or leaves you, or abandons you, and it hurts. And then there are the sins which you commit against other people. Selfishness, laziness, unkindness, thoughtlessness, hateful words, selfish actions. And all of them cause sorrow for other people, and they cause sorrow for you too, because the guilt of it sits upon you. But none of those sorrows can take your joy away. The devil can't take your joy away. The world can't take your joy away. Your flesh can't take your joy away. Notice what Jesus said. He said that when he died, he said, you will weep and lament, and the world will rejoice. He's talking about the unbelieving world and the kingdom of the devil. The devil, who he called the prince of this world, he thought he had won. But then Jesus rose, and he says, now you will rejoice. Their joy will be turned into sorrow, and your sorrow will be turned into joy, a joy that will never end, so that you can stand the grave side of a loved one, and you can grieve. Because of the pain that sin has brought into this world, and yet you can rejoice, knowing that all who sleep in Christ will be raised to eternal glory. It means that you can grieve over the weight of your sins in repentance, and also rejoice because you know that your sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ's death and his life. Yes, certainly, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything in an instant. It changes Confusion and all truth, it changes sorrow into eternal joy. A joy which never ends. A joy which finally will overcome all the sorrows of this world, as we read about in Revelation 21. A joy which leads to the joy of heaven, where sorrow and pain and suffering and crying will all be taken away forever. And where you will bask eternally in the sunshine joy 